Are you enjoying yourselves? Okay, well, we have another treat for you and for the senses, this time the ears. Well, it's all been about the ears, hasn't it? Yeah, musical, musical. Um, our next speaker is Olaf Deagle, and David Asbury, I asked him about a year ago to what he thought about this idea of bringing in digital musical instruments, and he didn't say no, <laughs> okay? But uh, you all know David, some of you, guitarist, active performer, teacher, scholar, and adjudicator who has appeared on concert stages in Europe, Canada, Central America, and throughout the United States. He's been a recipient of numerous awards, including the Diploma of Merit from the Academy Chicana in Siena, Italy. He has served on the faculty of Southwestern University since 1992, helping his students to pursue both graduate studies and move into the professional arena. He received his Master and Doctor of Musical Arts degrees from the University of Texas at Austin, where he worked under the direction of Adam Holtzman. When I thought about matching David up with Olaf Deagle, I knew this innovative thinker would be fascinated by the 3D printed sculptural guitars, and he was. Sucked him right in. Before David comes out, we have two of his students who will be giving you a performance on these guitars. This is Gideon Nelson and Joss Gilpin. Would you welcome them? Thank you. 
our uh, two students chose uh, this particular tune because of uh, its connection to our symposium. Donald Fagan, uh, one half of the rock supergroup Steely Dan, wrote his hit song International Geophysical Year for his 1982 debut solo album, The Nightfly. The song, the first track on the A side of the LP, was soon released afterwards as a single and became an international bestseller. In it, Fagan shares a nostalgic vision of his youth, where the technological promise of the future was fuel for his childhood imagination. The song's title refers to a series of highly publicized scientific activities that, according to the National Academy of Sciences, spanned the period of July 1957 through December 1958 and involved coordinated efforts from 67 countries. Technical panels were formed to pursue work in the following areas, aurora and air glow, cosmic rays, geomagnetism, glaciology, gravity, ionospheric physics, longitude and latitude determination, meteorology, oceanography, rocketry, seismology, and solar activity. In addition, a technical panel was set up to attempt to launch an artificial satellite into orbit around the Earth. It is in this context that we hear Fagan reminisce about being 10 years old and dreaming of what a wonderful, what a beautiful world it will be. Had our next speaker been at this stage of his career in the 1950s, I feel sure that he would have been involved in the International Geophysical Year. Most likely, as a scientific representative from New Zealand, or Switzerland, or Germany, Canada, England, South Africa, Japan, Sweden. You'll hear more on that story in just a moment. But it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to you, Dr. Olaf Diegel, who comes to us by way of Lund, Sweden. There's more. Where others see obstacles and problems, Dr. Deagle sees the potential for opportunity and growth. Over the past 10 years, he has developed over 60 viable new products, including home health monitoring systems, new and innovative theater lighting, security products, marine products, and a portable 3D printer for concrete designs, amongst many other things. For these works, Dr. Deagle has received an abundance of awards that include two gold medals at the 2010 Concours Lapine in Paris, the 2009 New Zealand nomination in the Electronic Health and Environment category at the World Summit Awards, the 2008 Bayer Innovation Awards in the Health and Science category for his work in the area of predictive health monitoring, and in 2006, the New Zealand Engineering Excellence Awards, uh, he won the Innovator of the Year Prize. In the spring of 2014, Dr. Deagle accepted a post on the faculty of Lund University School of Engineering in the Department of Design Sciences. He is a professor of product development and heads the machine design and product development program. Prior to this position, he spent more than a decade serving on the faculty of Massey University in his native New Zealand, where he was twice awarded lecturer of the year. A prolific writer, tireless editor, and much sought after public speaker, Dr. Deagle is also heavily involved in scientific fundraising and grant writing and serves on the boards and committees of numerous organizations in both the public and private sectors. His research interests are incredibly varied and include intelligent and mechatronic systems for smart home environments, indoor tracking systems, rapid product development, rapid prototyping and manufacturing technologies, domestic robot control algorithms, omnidirectional and autonomous vehicles, the development of project management software for highly creative projects, and oh yeah, he makes really cool guitars. <laughs> Dr. Deagle has a lifelong passion for music. He received classical training on the clarinet and trumpet and began playing electric bass and guitar as a teenager. Combining his love of music and engineering led to the development of the products that you just heard. In August of this year, a musical first was achieved in Lund when a group there performed a concert on exclusively 3D printed instruments. In addition to guitars, the concert also featured drums, bass, and keyboards. A 3D saxophone is in the works. For me personally, the implications of manufacturing concert quality instruments with imaginative acoustical designs that would not deplete our supply of endangered toadwoods is beyond exciting. What a beautiful world it will be. 
Please help me in welcoming Dr. Olaf Diegel. Thank you and good afternoon all. Um, yeah, as David said, thank you very much for the great uh, introduction and Josh and Gideon for a great little performance there. Um, yes, my name is Olaf Diegel and I confess I am an engineer, but today I'm going to be talking to you a bit about, to me what's really exciting about 3D printing is how it becomes a tool and a catalyst for creative thinking and really changing the way we think about things. So that's really what I'm going to be talking to you guys about today. But I thought maybe just to give you a bit more background about me and about the story of my life, so this is my history, I guess, uh, born in New Zealand, but I've lived just about everywhere. I think confused is the technical term. Um, now I've been in Sweden for eight months, but New Zealand before that for about 20 years, and it's always good to show some embarrassing pictures. So I was one of the kids from the original Sound of Music family. Uh, no, not quite. We were five kids in the family, and my father's German, so we all wore leather, leather shorts and strange shirts and had a little orchestra playing for the grandparents. It was all very cute, but I guess that's what got me started playing music as a kid, as a teenager. Um, and then throughout my life as an engineer, I have always played music. Um, my undergraduate degree was in electronics. This was in South Africa, and I went to, I studied electronics because my dad said, you're going to be an engineer. So off I went and studied electronics. But just to show you what a geek I was, while I was studying electronics, I was also in a medieval music group where we played uh, <laughs> the ultimate geek, you know, engineering and medieval music. So one of my friends was doing his master's in medieval music. And the interesting thing here is we built all the instruments ourselves. So in, in my garage, we built all the instruments. And again, that comes back later to the 3D printed guitars. I did a few stints in rock bands as well, but my most recent job was I was professor of mechatronics and product development. So mechatronics is a combination of electronic software and uh, computer engineering. When you think about any product from your iPhone to your car to a guitar, really they're all a combination of some mechanical, some electronics, some software engineering. So product development really is my background and what I was about. And I confess I'm a relatively new academic. I've been with academia about 12, 13 years. Before that, I was developing products for a whole range of companies. A lot of home health monitoring. I spent many years de developing lighting systems for theaters exactly like this. So both the spotlights and the, ele uh, the electronic control systems for theater. I did some software projects along the way. All of this got me interested in better ways of developing products faster and better products that really meet the needs of the customer. And that's what got me back to university after many years of working. I did a master's in project management and then a PhD in product development, and that I thoroughly enjoyed, and that's what got me into academia. And it's also what got me interested in CAD as a tool to help us develop better products faster. And then a natural extension of that, you've now designed the product in a virtual world, you now want to make the real thing to test it out, and that's what got me interested in 3D printing. This was in the mid-90s when it was still called rapid prototyping. And since then, I've been, I've been an avid user, I've been passionate about it, I really believe it's got the potential to change the world. So where 3D printing to me gets interesting is it's not a new technology, it's 30 years old now. 1989, 1990, we saw the first, I guess, commercial machines out there. But for the bulk of those 30 years, it's been used for prototyping. So you have an idea for a product, before you spend 50,000, 100,000, 500,000 getting to market with it, you make a prototype to make sure your idea is right. Otherwise, it can be a very expensive mistake. Um, for the last three, four, five years, however, you, we've seen the technology evolve to the point where it's starting to get used for manufacturing. So this is no longer prototyping. This is making the real product that you sell to the customers. And pretty much all the slides in the next 20 slides or so, they're all examples of com commercial products you can go out and buy today. One of the things we found, though, is this particularly the last five years, every week we see newspaper stories, magazine stories, TV stories about 3D printing and how it's going to completely change the world. And yes, it is, but at the same time, we've seen quite a few myths generated around 3D printing. And it's actually interesting to look at that. And one of the first ones is that 3D printing is going to kill manufacturing as we know it. And I don't think that's ever going to happen. I think 3D printing is a complementary technology that in certain cases, if you use it for the right reading, Absolutely, it's got inconceivable advantages over conventional manufacturing, but it's not going to replace conventional manufacturing. It's something you have to use for the right reasons. And some of those reasons, the first one, probably the best known one, we've heard this um, quite a bit this morning, Bruce mentioned it about this ability to make complex shapes that you couldn't make before. So it's called complexity for free. With traditional manufacturing, the more complicated something is, the more expensive it gets to make, to the point where it's impossible. 
3D printing doesn't care. The more complex, the better. In fact, it's the other way. If something's too simple, don't 3D print it. There's better ways of making it. But when it gets complex, so the next few examples are all just examples of this. And the first is art and design. I mean, artists love this technology. In the past, artists would conceive something, they'd get it onto a computer, they'd take it to the local engineering shop and say, please, sir, can you make me one of those? And the engineers would laugh at them and say, don't be stupid, it's impossible, it can't be done. Suddenly, they've now got a tool where they hit the print button and a few hours later, they've got the real product ready to, to work with. I mean, that is incredible when you think about it. This is a really interesting example from the world of marketing. So this is Onitsuka, the Japanese company that makes ASICs running shoes. So they make gym shoes. And this was a pure marketing campaign, no useful purpose other than just really cool. And it's called the Electric Tigerland campaign. It's a Japanese city in a shoe. And just to show you some close-ups, I mean, this is incredible. Now try to imagine making that by hand, how many years you'd be there carving away with little dental tools. So, but what's cool about this story is it was a marketing campaign, it went viral, it was a very, very successful marketing campaign on YouTube, there's videos of the fly around the shoes and it kept growing in popularity and it got so popular. So this was designed by a uh, designer called Yana Kitan and who used to be with Freedom of Creation and it got so popular people said that's cool, we'd like to buy some. So they started making a range, range of keychains and memory sticks based on the shoe and it kept growing in popularity to the point where they actually made a range of shoes. And it's the only example I know of where the marketing campaign has generated a product rather than the other way around. But to me, this is a perfect sign of what 3D printing does. It changes the way you think. It, it really flips things around and makes you think a little bit differently. Um, the next example is probably the ultimate student accessory. It's a titanium 3D printed bottle opener. Every student should have one. The point here, so this is the previous complexity for free, well, for free was, let's call it artistic. It was to do really complicated, complicated shapes from an arts point of view. This is now the engineering side of things. It's called topology optimization, in which you try to remove as much material from a part as possible to make it light, while at the same time preserving the engineering parameters, the characteristics of it. So for example, on an airplane, if you can lose a few pounds off an airplane in weight, that's thousands and thousands of dollars a year you save in petrol. So this particular bottle opener, to give you the example, if you were gonna make it the traditional way with a block of, say, aluminium, you would start with a block you see on the bottom there and it weighs about 10 and a bit grams. You would then machine away, you'd cut away 40, 50, up to 90% of that to make the part you see in the middle there, which would weigh 4.2 grams, so just over four grams. In contrast, what you see on screen there, the topology optimized one weighs less than a gram, yet it's rated at 300 kilos. So you're now able to make parts that are much, much lighter than before that would be impossible to make any other way because they're just too complex to be cast or molded or what have you. So this is the engineering example of that complexity for free. And to me, this is the big one that we've only just started to exploit, mainly by, I guess, aeronautic and automotive industry. The next big reason to use 3D printing over conventional is what's called mass customization which means we're making all the products, we're making a thousand products at the same time, but every product is custom made for you as the user. Perfect example, shoe soles. There are now companies that make shoe soles where they'll scan the bottom of your foot, print you out a shoe sole that fits you perfectly, which means it, you know, great example of that mass customization. Probably the biggest area this is being used in is medical devices. So hearing aids, for example, on the top right, about 96% of the world's inner ear hearing aids today are 3D printed. We don't even know they're 3D printed. We don't care that they're 3D printed. All we care about is we have a product that fits us perfectly. Hip replacements, there's been about 30 or 40,000 hip replacements, 3D printed titanium hip replacements implanted into patients today. And again, you'll notice the outer surface of that hip replacement is porous, so that when you implant it, the bone grows into it. It's called osteointegration, where the bone grows into the hip replacement, which means it's stuck there permanently. With, with a standard one, you might have to go in for subsequent surgeries for them to tighten it up so it, you know, when it goes a bit loose. So probably medical is the biggest area where we all have different bodies, so it's ideally suited for that whole area of mass customizing product where you'll make a whole range of them. Then, of course, this is a feel-good story from New Zealand. So at Massey University, we had a dog with cancer of the jaw, so we printed them out a titanium jaw replacement. And again, the same very lightweight, porous structure. And within the feel-good part is within 24 hours, the dog was eating again. I mean, that's quite amazing. And I've heard a story about a French, uh, a French surgeon who did the same thing with a woman where they did the entire jaw, and apparently the next day they couldn't shut her up. <laughs> so, true story. Um, yeah. Um, this possibly because of my interest in lighting, I've always li loved lighting and lighting products, but this really demonstrates a complexity for free. All of these lights are printed as a single piece. They're not assembled afterwards, 
But in terms of mass customization, the one in the middle is a British artist called Lionel Dean, and it's called a tuber. And on his website, he's written an app where that light is continuously morphing around, adding tubers, twisting around, changing shape. When you see something you like, you say, stop, buy now. And a week later, you get a light that nobody else in the world has got the same light. So you know, it's a nice demonstration of mass customization. And I, I predict that within the next three, four, five, ten years, we're going to be starting to see more and more of that. Where when we go shopping online, we'll customize our product online, buy it. And this is the kind of application where additive manufacturing or 3D printing will be ideal to use for. And probably the ultimate mass customization, of course, is printing mini-me's, people. From little wedding cake baubles to Star Wars figurines, about a year and a half ago, two years ago, they did the first 3D printed photo booth in Japan, where I think it was about seven seconds for a full body scan. And now these have proliferated all over the place. Uh, Disneyland, you can now go with your kids to Disneyland, scan your kid's face, and get a Cinderella doll with their own face printed on it. Very, very cool. But really, the next slide is a really strange, the extremely strange application of this. So there, there's, a, um, there's a scientist in Brazil called George Lopez who does a lot of work with, um, essentially with MRI or um, sonar, ultrasound information for fetuses. So when there's a problem with the fetus, from the ultrasound or the MRI data, he'll print a physical model so the doctor can plan his surgery. So incredibly useful. I mean, this saves lives every year and saves a lot of money. So this is a really good use of this mass customization, but just because I like sort of the creative use of things, the next one is a company in Japan saw what this guy was doing for good surgical reasons and came up with something called the shape of an angel. And they thought there was a market for mothers who'd want to buy a little keychain or cell phone chain with their unborn baby, sort of, you know, the face of your baby. I haven't followed the story, story to see if it was going to be a business success. I suspect not, but it is creative. You know, from a creative use of the technology, this is incredible. You know, people doing things really differently because of the technology. Now we get into slightly harder to understand, the ability to print complete products. Now what we mean by this is both moving parts, and I'll show you a video in a few minutes of a product with moving parts, but also the ability to take a product that traditionally would have been made out of 10, 15, 100 parts, consolidate a lot of those simple parts into one much more complex part and print it in one piece. So two examples of that. The first one is a UAV, so an unmanned aerial vehicle. So it's basically think of it as a model plane. And for anybody who's built a model plane, typically you're talking several hundred components, or on a UAV like this, it could be up to a thousand components. Here the entire airplane is printed in four components. You see the two wings, the fuselage, and, and the nose cone, and that's it. So the little flaps, the ailerons that allow the plane to go up and down are printed as an integral part of the wing. No assembly required. So you get to the airfield, you slide in the electronics. The electronics are not 3D printed. They're done the conventional day today, but there are people working on that. In a few years, we will be able to print the electronics. So you slide in your electronic assembly, clip on the wings, put on the nose cone, and you're ready to fly. I mean, that is incredible when you think about it. And you see the wings on the top there, they're very, very thin, 0 0.6 millimeter skin around the outside with scaffolding on the inside to make them very rigid, but very light at the same time. This one's another UAV, so unmanned aerial vehicle rated one. This is one we did in New Zealand for the New Zealand uh, Navy. And on the model plane you saw earlier, they have something called a pitot tube underneath, which is a tube to, to measure air uh, speed. It looks at pressure differentials to look at how fast the airplane is going. In this case, the original piece was made out of 32 different components brazed together to make a working assembly. Our first redesign for them, which is the one in the middle there, we did as a single component, and it worked. Single component printed in nylon, and it worked perfectly. One thing we didn't know about is when these airplanes land, they land in the beach on the sand, and the front of the tube gets filled up with sand, and that became a problem because it became difficult to empty out the sand. So the final design, which they're now using in production, is the one you see down in the bottom there, the bottom right, made out of two components. And the only reason for the two components is so you can take off the front cone so you can empty out the sand when it gets full. But it's a really nice example. Think about it, going from 32 components down to two components. The saving in time and assembly labor, a reliable increase in reliability. Um, it's incredible the advantage you get out of that. So those first three examples, complexity for free, mass customization, being able to print working assemblies, are what I would call engineering advantages. Now we get to the softer side, which to me are probably the more important ones. And this first one is the ability to be able to try an idea out at no risk. So if you have an idea for a product, it's going to cost you typically many tens of thousands up to many hundreds of thousands of dollars to get your idea into a prototype that you can try to test to make sure it's a good idea. 
3D printing removes that. You cannot go to market with your idea without having to mortgage your house. So a couple of examples for that. And the first one is actually one of my students. So I, I hesitate to call it a business. Maybe it's a micro business. So this is Jenna McGill, one of our students in Auckland. And this was a graduate student. She's a cyclist, a mountain cyclist, who does, goes around the world for Red Bull, doing crazy things on mountain bikes. And one of the problems she got, she travels around the world with a mountain bike in a cardboard box, which is too big to really handle around the airport. It's too big to put on a trolley because it won't th go through doors. So very simple idea. She said, no problem. I'll print out a set of clip-on wheels that you can clip onto, well, any box. And it works. And she now uses this to go around the world. Other people in the team saw that and said, that's fantastic. Can we buy some? And of course, she started selling them. So to date, she's sold about 60 or 70 sets of these. And the point is, she was able to do this without having to invest a lot of capital in it. Now she's at the stage where she could decide, yeah, there is a real market for this. I'm going to invest a bit in tool for it or not. I'll keep making them. It's high enough value that I will keep making them this way. But, you know, the ability to try that idea out to make sure it's a good idea is just worth unbelievable amounts of money. This one's probably a slightly less politically correct example, though maybe in Texas it might be fine. Uh, <laughs> Rifle suppressors, so this is a titanium rifle suppressor printed inside the rifle suppressor with some baffles and cavities and porous areas to absorb the gas. That lowers the decibels down to below what's needed for hearing protection. And these are now being made for the New Zealand Defense Force and also they're now sort of selling to the Canadian uh, Army. So the point here is not the product. The point here is that they were able to go to market with this product and it cost them nothing as a setup cost, as the investment to tool up for it and to get set up for production for this. And that is what's important here. So another New Zealand example, this is um, Team New Zealand for the America's Cup, which America actually won last time, but New Zealand won it a few times ago. What we're interested in in this case is every sailor, either on their jacket or on their belt, has got a 3D printed titanium knife. And again, it's, so if they fall overboard and they're wrapped up in ropes, it's, they can cut themselves free. So this is a 3D printed knife printed in titanium. Again, very lightweight mesh structures to make it up to remove as much weight as possible. Incredibly effective, hardened, it's almost unbreakable. And again, no investment. So Victory Knives was able to take a new product to market. Since then, they've got several other knives they've taken to market with no major investment at all, other than the time to design them. So. This gets me to my own story with the 3D printed um, guitars. And this was a story in The Economist from 2011 where they took the blueprints of a Stradivarius violin, tatted them up, and 3D printed them. And what you see on the bottom right is the violins coming out of the powder. So it's a powder-based process where they laser sinter the powder. Uh, Mary talked about it a bit this morning. And just to show you that the violin is, re is real, and we hope we have a bit of sound there. And in this case, the entire violin, except for the arch and the bridge, is printed all as a single piece. The neck, the body, all printed in one piece. On the tuning pegs are separate, of course. And the professionals who play it say it sounds like a violin. It's a bit heavier than a violin, but it does sound like a violin. Now, what you've got to remember is here, they did it to show it could be done. They didn't do it to design the ultimate violin. And really, if you wanted to do a good 3D printed violin, you need to redesign for the materials, for the manufacturing process, then potentially you could get a violin that sounds, well, if it's possible, better than a Stradivarius. It's all very subjective, of course, but redesigning for the process. So I saw this story um, in 2011, and, and I've been watching the technology get better and better over the years, and I thought, well, I wonder if it's possible to make a 3D printed electric guitar. And we're talking not about a prototype of a guitar, but the real guitar that is, you know, that you can play forever. Um, and I was in South Africa at my parents' place on holiday, and I was bored, so I designed my first one, got back to New Zealand and printed it. And basically, I've now got a range of about a dozen different guitars. I've sold 48 of them, so it's a micro business. It's a very, I mean, I wouldn't even call it, it's a hobby business, something I do on the side. Um, the very first one I did was a spider version of the pink one on the top right there. And the reason it's that shape is not because it's the most beautiful shape in the world, but that's the biggest I could fit in the printer I had in New Zealand. From there, I designed the first one I actually designed was the one on the top left, the Atom. So once I designed the first one, the, the triangular one, I blogged about it and said, look, here's something cool I've done. What do you think? People started to respond and say, that's fantastic. Can we buy one? So I scratched my head and said, ooh, what do I do now? Um, all right, I'll sell you one. And I sold one, then two, then five, and it sort of grew from there. And I've, like I said, now I've sold 48 of them. And I've got about a dozen different designs. I think the American one is in the gallery, I think. And, uh, the one on the bottom right, the steampunk, um, this is one of the more interesting ones. So we have a little video clip showing this one. And the entire body with all the gears all move. 
Now remember, we talked about working assemblies. This is the example. This entire body is printed in one piece with all the gears, the pistons all in it, all as a single moving component. And that is pretty mind-boggling when you think. It hurts the brain a bit to think about it. But again, these guitars are a good example. They have mass customization because every guitar I make is custom made for the musician. From the very simple thing of writing their name on the back of it, I've offered people to scan their faces and put their faces in the guitar. Nobody's gone for that yet, but it could happen. Um, yeah, and you know, being able to pr print complete working assemblies. So I printed my first one on my baby printer that I had in New Zealand. Then I, uh, 3D Systems, one of the big manufacturers of printers said, that's cool, we'd like to help you go with some of the bigger ones. So they started printing the bigger ones. And it sort of grew from there. From there, they challenged me to say, well, we want to do a full 3D printed orchestra. So we did no problem, we did a keyboard. So this is a keyboard based on the same design as the pink guitar with butterflies and, and flowers inside of it. From there, grew, we did a full 3D printed drum kit, and tonight I think there's going to be a band playing here with um, 3D printed drums and guitars and so on. So for any of you, of, of you who are interested in hearing it, uh, that's your chance. And of course, most recently, I did a 3D printed saxophone. Now this one, I have to say, essentially doesn't work. I struggled to get eight notes out of it. It squeaks, it's horrible, but for a first try, I was amazed that I could actually get even one note out of it. And I think the next version will work perfectly. I, one of the problems, I copied a traditional saxophone design for this. So pretty much this is a duplicate of a standard metal saxophone. And of course, I need to redesign for plastic. None of the springs, for example, which are normally hammered into the metal, when you do the same in the plastic, they just twist around and it doesn't work. So now I've got to redesign it with either magnets of springs or built-in springs. I don't quite know yet. I've got to do some trials to get it right. But the next version of this will be, I'm pretty confident, a fully working saxophone. So yeah, coming soon. Um, now we go into the crazier area, which is similar to the previous area, but it's about encouraging creativity and innovation. And to me, this is probably the most powerful thing about 3D printers, is the ability to stimulate our creativity. And one of the things I really like about 3D printers is children instantly understand the potential of a 3D printer. They see a 3D printer, they get it. They, they may not get the engineering of how it works, but they get what they can do with it. And they start to explore, much more so than adults. And it's actually amazing to see, you know, over the last five years, we're starting to see kids going back into making. We're probably over the last 15 years have been going more and more into the digital world of video games and so on. This is now to a small extent starting to bring some of that, some of that back. So some nice examples of encouraging innovation. This was an American eagle that lost its beak. So somebody said, no problem, let's print them out a new one. And that's what they did. They catted it up, printed it out, glued it on, literally glued it on with epoxy resin, and they gave the eagle a new lease on life. So don't get me wrong. This is not impossible to do the traditional way. You could take a block of a bone, carve it out by hand, but it's too hard, so we don't do it. Where suddenly we've got these tools that remove that obstacle of making, of manufacturing, and that's where they're powerful. That, there's now a Kickstarter campaign where they're trying to raise the funds to do the same thing for a toucan, you know, one of the birds with the huge beaks, trying to do the same thing. But really nice example of you know, creative use of the technology. The next one's even a little bit stranger. This is Miles Lightwood in San Francisco who did something called Project Shelter. So her, her habitats for hermit crabs. And <laughs> as I said, it's, it's, yeah, it's weird, but it's interesting. Um, Apparently, when hermit crabs lose their shell, they'll move into any available container, and you see one on the bottom left there on the, in, a, in a Coke bottle cap. And now there's a maker movement. So all these desktop printers have proliferated around the world, and there's about 600 different manufacturers of these. So a lot of what used to be called geeks are now called makers, and they have these machines, and they make useful stuff with them. Um, and he decided, no problem, I'll see if I've got a maker bot, I'll print out a hermit crab shell. And he's got videos on his website of an aquarium with a hermit crab sort of circling around the shell and moving into it. And as I understand it, he's now got the San Francisco maker community that when their machines have got downtime, they print hermit crab shells and throw them to the harbor. I I'm exaggerating a little bit here, but you know, I mean, and create habitats for hermit crabs. And you think of the environmental impact of throwing all this plastic into the harbor, I'm not entirely sure about, but the point here is creative use of technology. And this is a technology, because it breaks the barriers of making stuff, really opens up that, you know, the creative barrier that's been in the past. Again, from Japan, this was Valentine's Day, not this last one, the year before. Um, and they had a Valentine's Day chocolate printing promotion where you bought a box of chocolates for your boyfriend or girlfriend, and there was your head printed in chocolate sticking out of them. <laughs> so yeah. I think that's a very, very cool. I, I don't think whether you'd be frightened to death when you open the box, but still. 
and the MIT Media Lab Eat Your Face Machine. So chocolate printers, there's now quite a few of them. Some are available on Kickstarter. You can buy them commercially. Um, chocolate that'll print in sugar or chocolates and various other materials like that. But yeah, like I said, very creative use. So this one's a fairly recent. This is about six months ago. They did a 3D printed car at one of the big car shows, the IMTS. They, on, while people were watching, they printed out a working car. This is not the first car. There have been several other cars printed before that. There's the Irby up in Canada was printed about five or six years ago. But this was a really nice example of using one of those large FBM printers like we have in the lobby to print a car. So this is not the one I actually want to show you. This was just to introduce the next one, which is another crazy example from New Zealand. So this is a guy in New Zealand called Ivan Sench, and he decided he had a little 3D printer, and he decided, what shall I do with it? I know, I'll build myself a car. And this, I have to say, has got to be the most stupid way of building a car I've ever seen. But what's cool is the creative use of the technology, saying, I'll do it anyway. And he's done it. And he claims it's going to be a drivable Aston Martin DB4 when he's finished. Let's wait and see and uh, yeah, see what happens with it. But again, I repeat, the point is here, you know, what can we do with this technology that we wouldn't have done otherwise? And this is a really, really nice example of that. Marcus Kaiser, well-known artist now doing the Solar Center project, where he goes out into the Sahara and uses basically a big Fresnel lens to focus the sun onto the sand, to melt the sand, moves it around exactly the same as a laser sintering system would, and he builds sculptures, glass vitrified sand sculptures out of glass. I mean, that is an incredibly creative use of the technology again. And there's some very good videos on his website where he spends three days in one of those silver tents in the des desert while he's making his art. Very, very impressive use. And again, think about it. Zero energy cost, almost. Zero material cost. So yeah, very, very interesting application there. This is one from the UK, and this is one that I think serves no useful purpose, but it's just a cool example of the use of the technology. So somebody had the corner of their stair missing, and they decided, no problem, I've got a 3D printer. I'll print myself out a new Lego replacement corner. So they catted it up, printed it out, painted, glued it back in. And I think that is incredibly cool. If I walked past and saw that, I would be impressed. I would say, you know, that is creative. Yeah. Like I said, not very useful, but very, very creative use of the technology. And of course, more recent one, and we see one of those in the lobby outside. So this is the enabling the future hand. Um, it actually started by a South African guy called Richard Van Aas. He was an amateur carpenter, and he lost two fingers in a carpentry accident. So he teamed up with an American called Ivan Owen, and they did the, what's called the robo hand. Well, they first printed him out a prosthetic to, to uh, replace his two fingers, but from there that grew into a project to develop low-cost prosthetics for developing countries. Incredibly good. And this is now expanded into something called Enabling the Future, which is essentially it's an open source prosthetics organization where you can download the files for various prosthetics, modify them for your own particular condition, and then print them and then re-upload them for others to, you know, to, upload, to download. So incredibly beneficial, really, really good use of the technology. And just to show you day two of therapy, just to show you what impact these, ha these hands have, it's incredible. On day two of therapy, these children have relearned how to use their hands. And of course, they all have different conditions, so every hand has to be customized for those particular conditions. Now, don't misunderstand me. These hands are nowhere near the quality of a $10,000 hand you would get here in a developed country. But considering these kids have got nothing, this is an incredible, this changes their lives at a very low cost. Typically $50 to $150, they print out a full prosthetic hand. So from that point of view, the technology is absolutely incredible. And this is possibly, to me, one of the best social use, good use of the technology that I've ever seen. So that brings us to the last sort of big advantage, which is on-demand manufacturing. Now, to me, this is something that has not happened yet, but will be happening over the next few years. So the idea is, instead of your garage having a back room full of spare parts, they'll print the parts as and when they need them. Um, the American military is putting huge money into this so that when they go into another country, instead of having shiploads and truckloads of spare parts, they'll bring a couple of 3D printers and they'll download their files from the net and print their parts out as they need them. NASA now has 3D printers on the space station doing the same thing with the idea of being able to print replacement parts. So to my mind, this is not happening today, but will be happening very, very soon over the next few years. So the simple example is you think about the supply chain, which is essentially how we get products. And as a simple example, before the Industrial Revolution, you were the supply chain. So if, for example, you wanted a chair, you made the chair yourself. You were the entire supply chain. Possibly, if you were wealthy, you might take some eggs and barter them with the black, 
blacksmith for some nails, but essentially your village was the supply chain. Even the village on the other side of the hill was too far. That was like another country. You compare that to today, where you're the customer at that end, you'll drive to Walmart and buy your chair. They get it trucked in from a warehouse in somewhere in New Orleans, who get it shipped in from a warehouse in Guangzhou, who get it trucked in from a factory somewhere else in China. The supply chain is absolutely enormous. And when we talk about environmental impact, you think about all of that transport in between. What would happen if we could eliminate all of that? You think about the cost of products. Typically, the cost of a product, less than 10% of what you're paying is the real cost of the product. The other 90% is the supply chain. Not just the transport, it includes the transport, but every middleman is taking 10%, 15%, 20% on, on top of that. That all adds up. So the idea of possibly the future of how you would get your chair is you'll drive to the local, I've called it a fab lab, but it's the local 3D printing manufacturing center with your memory stick. And you'll give it to them and say, please print me the chair. You come back an hour later and your chair is done ready to take home. And the only part of the supply chain is you driving to the store and maybe the, the raw materials coming in. And there are some people predicting that in the near future, we'll go back to the pre-industrial revolution days where everybody will have a 3D printer at home and when you need your chair, you'll print it yourself. Personally, I don't think that'll ever happen, and I'll show you why in the next slide, but people do think that. Now, the tomorrow model, companies like FedEx and DHL are actively investigating this, and the idea is if you're gonna buy a toy, say, in San Francisco and ship it to New York, well, why not just upload the data to the cloud, download it to the other, and print the toy in New York? And they're actually actively investigating this. So we could see over the next two, three, four, five years, this starting to become a reality, where they start to reduce the supply chain by using additive manufacturing. Now, not all products will be suitable for this. It'll be only certain type, high value, typically low volume products that will be suitable for this. But this leads us to sort of one of the other myths, is that every home will have a 3D printer. And in a way, I completely agree. I predict that within the next five years, every home will have a 3D printer. But it will not be a 3D printer that we use to make everything in the home it'll be aimed pretty much 99% at hobbies and toys. And my prediction is that one Mattel or Fisher Price or one of the toy companies in the next two or three years will come up with a half decent desktop 3D printer, maybe 200 to $300. When they come up with that, that'll be the best selling Christmas present of the year and all the parents will buy them for their kids at Christmas to make toys. And the example I use down the bottom is many of us have got sewing machines at home, yet we're not all wearing homemade clothes. And it's the same analogy where most products have got multiple materials in them. Most 3D printers only deal with one material. So there's is electronics in most products. 3D printers cannot handle that and won't for many years to come. Even when they do, the question will be, will you be able to design those products and so on. So like I said, I predict we will all have 3D printers. I personally think now, today, every designer, every engineer, every artist should have one of these desktop 3D printers at home. They're so cheap, you can't afford not to. And there's so much benefit in terms of exploring ideas and being crea creative with them. The next myth, desktop 3D printers versus professional machines. And it's one of the constant problems with the media. When the media talk about 3D printing, they'll show a $1,500 desktop 3D printer and one of my guitars next to it, and people say, ooh, I buy one of these cheap machines, I can make my own guitars. Not quite. It's not, and the analogy I use here is a toy car, where you compare the toy car to a real car. Both are absolutely fantastic. I can't say one is better than the other. To the six-year-old kid, the toy car is better because he's actually allowed to drive it. It's exactly the same with 3D printers. They're both fantastic. I really, I honestly believe everybody probably in this audience should have a 3D printer at home. But that's not the same as a million-dollar industrial machine. So you do all your creative thinking, your, your exploration of ideas on your desktop 3D printer, and then you might go to service bureau for the real printer on one of the higher end machines, the industrial systems. New, but different materials, different technology, different strength. So I think this is probably a fairly important message that has gotten lost a bit by the media, and it's one that's fairly important to keep in mind. Um, the next one, this one's probably one of the less well-known myths. A lot of people think you hit pretty, the magic button, print, two hours later you've got a part that's magically ready to go. Not the case, 99%, well actually all printers, you need a lot of post-processing. So when the part comes off the printer, at the very least, you're gonna have to peel off the support material. That takes time, whether it's minutes or hours, depends on the part. Probably you're gonna have to glue bits together or you're gonna have to paint the part. All of that takes time, which is effort, which is money. 
So there's still, but a lot of people will still go in buying a 3D printer thinking, I'll buy this 3D printer and I'll get magic parts coming off the end. Not the case. Um, and again, it's a learning thing. Once you learn, once you understand this, it's not a disadvantage. It's just something to be aware of. And two little examples of that. Um, this is Lionel Dean, the same artist who does the light, and this is um, one of his designs called the Icon Design. The print time on that is eight and a half hours and roughly the same time to polish it up to get it into the state you see it there. So you see the making, the printing time is one thing, the polishing is another. The guitar bodies on that one on the hive takes um, 11 hours to print. If I paint it in a, in a plain color, it takes me basically a whole day. This one's been airbrushed by an artist friend of mine and that takes him a couple of days to airbrush one of those. So much longer to paint it than it does to actually get it all you know, looking absolutely beautiful and so on. So really, really, really important to keep that in mind. And keeping in mind all of these advantages and disadvantages, they're exactly there. The same thing happens if you're going to cast a part. If you're going to cast an engine block, you're going to need to bore out the pistons. You're going to need to skim the heads. If you cast a bronze sculpture, I think Bruce said this morning that he spent, I can't remember, was it several days or several weeks polishing the inside of the sphere or, or the, the acrylic sculptures he was making. It's the same thing. You know, it doesn't matter which method you use, there always will be pro post-processing. And so long as you understand that, it's not really a disadvantage. It's just something you do need to keep in mind. So another little example of this, and this probably does relate very closely to Bruce's example from this morning, a lens. And it's done on one of the, the liquid resin machines on a polyjet machine. And that, as it comes out of the machine on the right side, and then after a few hours of polishing, you can make it look optically clear like the one on the left but it is a few hours of elbow grease of polishing by hand or by machine, doesn't matter, it's still gonna be a bit of time. So as I said, these are just examples that you need to be aware of. They're not disadvantages, they're just, as long as you're aware of them and you look at them in when, you, when you're comparing 3D printing to traditional manufacturing, you've gotta realize that some of the constraints will be the same in terms of the post-processing and so on. So really today, all I've tried to do is give you guys a little bit of a flavor that to me, Particularly for me as an engineer, I think 3D printing, the most powerful thing, yes, it's absolutely fantastic for making stuff. If I need to make a gear, I will 3D print it. But the real power to me is in unleashing that creative potential that traditionally I think manufacturing, how, th how stuff is made up to date has been a barrier to us really exploring that creative printing, the creative thinking side of things. And to me, that's probably, in my mind, the biggest advantage that 3D printing gives us over conventional technologies. So really, I'll leave you with the thought that, you know, probably not a myth, and really the only way to learn about 3D printing is to try it. We heard Anthony talking about bioprinting. We can print in ceramics, metals, all sorts of different materials, but you've got to experiment, you've got to try, and probably you've got to learn some flavor of CAD. It doesn't matter which one it is, but, you know, all of these do originate from a digital model. So that's, you know, one of the things that, one of the requirements there is that you do have to learn a little bit, bit about CAD. So, thank you very much, thank you for listening, and happy to take um, any questions or thoughts from you guys, thank you. Thank you, Olaf. You ready for a few questions? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The microphone in, in the aisle in the right places. We have a time for a few minutes for questions. Seven. We'll get the technology to work. <laughs> Hello? There we go. Yeah. Uh, that car that you showed, I think you, uh, the, the black one, I believe you said it was in New Zealand. Um, how much of the car was printed? Uh, I mean, the tires weren't printed, were no. they? No. Uh, in, in fact, it's, it's another myth about 3D printed products. And I'll use my guitar as an example. People talk about 3D printed cars or 3D printed guitars. These are not 3D printed guitars. The necks are CNC'd out of wood. The bridges are cast out of metal. The pickup rings are injection molded. So really, again, it's a good question in that most 3D printed products only use 3D printing for the parts that really benefit from the 3D printing. So a very complex shape. So in this case, it was just the entire, call it the, the body and chassis of the car. But all the wheels, all the motors, the drive shafts were all standard off-the-shelf uh, components. Oh yeah. And again, same with my guitars. They're, they're, we talk about them as 3D printed, but they're not. Uh, relative to the last uh, slide that you have 
uh, with the spectacle lens. Um, I'm thinking of lenses now for eyeglasses that are 500 to $1,000 for a prescription. Would a person eventually be able to have their own prescription and print their own lenses? Ooh, eventually, yes. <laughs> um, there's a catch for me. First, the quality, there is, there's a, a Belgian company called LuxXL that is now able to print optically clear lenses. So the, the clarity is no problem. The catch-22 today is the price of the materials. And I, to me, it's, it's one of the challenges that the industry faces. The industry is all talking about rapid manufacturing, but the prices for the material are still very much at the rapid prototyping price. When you're prototyping, you don't really care that much about the, well, you do care, but you can go a lot higher on the material prices. But yeah, I, I would predict absolutely, yes, within, you know, who knows, five years, 10 years, you will be able to print prescription glasses on a 3D printer. It'll be a specialized printer. It won't be the, 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 you know, the desktop 3D printers you have at home. It'll be a specialized machine. But yes, they're already doing sort of LED arrays for car lights, for example, that way. So yes, eventually yes. You talk about, oh you talk about the daily like uh, 3D printer that would be on a desktop. Do you think the programming required to make it create something would stop this from being used by everyone? Because it sounds like that might be expensive or a lot of education on how I to use think, it. I, I think probably that the CAD industry in general could learn an enormous amount from the gaming industry. Because a lot of the gaming software, you're doing incredibly advanced CAD. I mean, I've got on my laptop, I've got a game called Spore Creature Creator where you design dinosaurs and you pull and stretch. And a five-year-old can design an incredibly complex CAD dinosaur with proper kinematics where it moves the right way. He doesn't even know he's doing CAD. Yet if you're running SolidWorks or Creo or whatever software you're using, you need a whole learning curve to get there. So to my mind, some of the industrial CAD packages need to learn some of this intuitive interfacing way where you learn how to CAD something. And you know, I mean, for example, if you're designing, say, a cell phone, you could have things like the battery and the, the, the LCD are fixed because you can't do those, but the rest could just be pulled and stretched to get it to fit your hand, for example. So yeah, I think the, the, the learn, I mean, can you imagine your grandmother trying to run a CAD package to design a new knob for her oven? It's not gonna happen. So yeah, we need something there. And I think in this case, the hardware is ahead of the software. The hardware is nowhere near where it needs to be, but it's probably ahead of the software in terms of ease of use and in intuitiveness. Did you actually produce a 3D printer of your own? I mean, um, quite a few of them. So the one we've done is for all the MakerBot clones out there. We've done one that runs off pellets. Um, so we can throw rubber pellets in it for So instead of filament, we put in regular injection molding pellets, which means cost-wise, it's now the same price to run as injection molders, so one-tenth of the price, roughly. And mostly, we use it for doing rubber insoles. Um, we're just now in the process of building our concrete printer, which will print in concrete. But pretty much everything we've done has been, actually, we've done one plaster powder printer where we've built our own as well. But mostly, it's been FDM technology, and we've done one plaster one. And we're now building a hybrid one that'll be powder, inkjet binder, and laser sintering all in the same machine. So I don't know what we're gonna do with it yet, but we're gonna try some experiments. No, they're just hobby. The, the print head the, is open source. So if you want the designs for that, we'll send you the designs. You can make your own and put it on your 3D printer and print in. That means you can print in any plastic, basically. So long as it doesn't shrink too much. Because if it shrinks too much, it'll, yeah. One last question. Can you tell me what range of materials 3D printers can accept, and do you need a different printer for each type of material? Uh, the short answer is yes. Unfortunately, so there's not enough of a range for a start. We need more material. That's where the big research is going on, is more material. But there are a whole different number of plastics you can run. ABS, PLA, polycarbonate, nylon, pol peak, which is a high-end plastic. So polymer is fairly well equipped. Uh, metals, you can do aluminum, titanium. That's, so that's gold and titanium printed ring. A stainless steel. You can do a number of ceramics, but not enough of them. But the problem is every, uh, it, the metal printer will do all the metals at the same time. The plastic ones, you've got different technology. The powder-based one, the resin-based one, and the solid, the filament-based mm -hmm. ones. Um, so yeah, and in a perfect lab, you need one of each machine, because each technology's got advantages and disadvantages, depending on what it is you're trying to do. So it makes for an expensive lab, because you need a whole bunch of kit make it work right. But yeah, definitely there's a shortage of material and we need more chemists and material scientists working on that, I think. Thank you, Olaf. Let's give him a good hand. Thank you.